Love can make you do crazy things, but some people are just naturally that way. Rainbot joins me for this special Valentine's edition of Twisted Tens. In May of 2008, Ricardo Marias broke things off with his girlfriend of four years, Tatiana Bastos, and moved on within weeks. Tatiana was less than thrilled to learn Ricardo already had a new girlfriend, so she began to stalk him. Tatiana ambushed Ricardo at work, demanding to know why he was ignoring her text messages. Feeling sorry for Tatiana, Ricardo offered to take her back to her apartment. The moment they got into the car, she began making sexual advances on Ricardo, which she rejected. Tatiana then snapped, and pulled out a six-inch kitchen knife from her purse and stabbed Ricardo's penis. In blinding pain, he stopped the car and managed to seek refuge with a passing motorist, who drove him to the hospital where he was stitched up and eventually recovered. Tatiana was ultimately charged with grievous bodily harm and handed a 32-month prison sentence for actions the judge has labeled as truly wicked. 18-year-old Ashley Doolittle seemed to have it all. She graduated from a high school in Burtown, Colorado, and was enrolled at Colorado State University for the fall. A champion horse rider, those around Ashley admired her hard work ethic and her infectious smile, including her 18-year-old boyfriend, Tanner Flores. But after one year of dating, Ashley ended things with Tanner, who was devastated and confused by the sudden breakup. Tanner sent alarming Snapchats to friends, hinting he was suicidal, even weeks after the breakup. Then, on June 9, 2016, Ashley's car was found abandoned on the side of the road, at the same time Tanner's father realized both his 22 caliber gun and his son were missing. Tanner had stolen the firearm and confronted Ashley, shooting her twice in the head. He then cleaned the body and shoved it into the back of his truck before driving five hours away to his grandfather's ranch in Colbrand, Colorado. Police desperately searched for Tanner and Ashley without any luck, but caught a break when a neighbor saw an arm sticking out of a bundle of blankets Tanner pulled from his truck. When a SWAT team swarmed the house on June 10th, Tanner was arrested as he attempted to destroy more evidence, but it was a wasted effort. He confessed his bitterness over the breakup fueled him to kill Ashley. Ashley was well-loved in her community and the death took a toll on her fellow classmates. But Tanner is being held without bond under two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree kidnapping. Hopefully, as the trial progresses, justice will be served. What better way to get back at an ex than to crash their wedding? That's exactly what 19-year-old Lisa Marie Cocker did in April 2009, when she showed up at her ex-boyfriend's matrimonial ceremony armed with a crowbar and razor. When the mother of the groom, Gail Hosey, refused to let Lisa into the facility, the scorned lover attacked her. Lisa came at Gail with the crowbar and eventually sliced a large cut into Gail's arm with the razor blade. Florida authorities quickly broke up the fight and sent Gail to the hospital where she received 16 stitches. Lisa was then transported away under charges of aggravated battery causing great bodily harm and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon in addition to grand theft, a steep price for her wedding crashing efforts. Married couple Katya Karitovonova and her husband Mikhail were on an evening stroll when they ran into Liza Dmitrieva, one of Katya's best friends. The three decided to spend the evening together watching War of the Worlds, but the night would end in very real blood and violence. The trio drank copious amounts of alcohol and Katya passed out first. Upon rousing, she was horrified to see her best friend performing oral sex on her husband who did nothing to stop her. Reacting out of furious jealousy, Katya knocked Liza out with a lamp, then bit off a portion of her husband's penis. Mikhail passed out, drunk, in blinding pain, and heavily bleeding. Katya eventually called for medical help, and doctors were able to salvage Mikhail's genitalia. Still, she was sentenced to two years behind bars at a Russian labor camp for her violent love bite. 
26-year-old Els Babs Clodemann and 38-year-old Els Van Doren not only shared a first name, but also a love of skydiving and a desire for the same man, Marcel Sommers. Marcel, a fellow member of their skydiving club, seemed to only have eyes for one of the women. Babs was an elementary school teacher and Van Doren a married mother of two, but Marcel took a particular liking to Van Doren. Babs was jealous, but still veed for Marcel's attention. Envy then turned to murderous rage after the trio spent the night at Marcel's apartment. Babs slept on the couch while Van Doren and Marcel made love in the next room over. Two weeks later, on November 18th, 2006, the three of them went for a 13,000 foot skydive over eastern Belgium. However, near the end of their fall, neither of Van Dorn's parachutes deployed, and she hit the ground at full speed, killing her instantly. After Van Dorn's death, Babs' behavior drew suspicion. She attempted suicide multiple times and made anonymous calls to Van Dorn's husband. Upon examining Van Dorn's failed equipment, authorities realized that both parachute cords had been severed. Babs became the prime suspect after detectives learned of the love triangle, and the trial commenced with Van Dorn's grieving family in attendance. In October of 2010, the jury saw Babs as a cold-blooded killer, hoping to sway the attention of Marcel by eliminating her competition, and sentenced her to 30 years behind bars for the parachute murder. In a quiet suburb of Adelaide, Australia, 44-year-old Regini Narayan discovered her husband of 20 years, Satish, was having an affair. Despite the abuse she'd suffered at his hands, she'd worshipped him and remained faithful. But that was about to change. On December 8, 2008, Regini planned to confront her husband. She gathered a candle and gasoline, intending to burn a dot on his penis, believing this would stop the affair. But when fire is added to gasoline, things tend to get a bit out of hand. Satish's only response to the accusations was to call Regini a fat, dumb bitch and roll over. Regini saw red and doused his groin in fuel, then set it aflame with the candle. Panicked, Satish knocked over a bottle of alcohol, spreading the flames further. Regini, Satish, and their three children escaped the house fire alive, but their home was destroyed and Satish suffered burns on 75% of his body, eventually perishing from his injuries. Though Regini said she hadn't meant to kill her husband, only to teach him a lesson, the justice system didn't see it that way. Regini was charged with murder, but in 2011, her six-year sentence was suspended. She was legally obligated to undergo psychological counseling and supervision for two years after her release, but walked free from her full sentence. In Clearwater, Florida, two teenage girls realized they were dating the same boy, 19-year-old Josh Camacho. When Josh was found out, he broke things off with Rachel Wade in favor of 18-year-old Sarah Ludman. But things were far from over between the girls. Over the course of six months, they fought in public, made vicious online attacks, and sent each other threatening texts and calls. Rachel wasn't about to let Josh go so easily, and Sarah was determined to keep him. Over time, Josh grew tired of Rachel's antics, and told her that he had no interest in her anymore. Rachel's pent-up anger and hostility finally culminated in April of 2009, when she left Sarah a voicemail saying she was going to kill her. Unintimidated, Sarah jumped into a vehicle and drove to confront Rachel, completely unaware that she was dangerously armed and ready to fight. Authorities claim that Sarah didn't even have enough time to get out of the car before Rachel zeroed in and pulled out a kitchen knife. A stab to the shoulder and a fatal blow to the heart, Rachel's force behind the jabs were so violent, they bent the blade. Rachel watched Sarah die, seemingly unmoved by her own horrific violence. Reportedly, when Pinellas Park police officers arrived, she calmly asked for a cigarette, unconcerned with the life she'd ended. Rachel tried to plead self-defense, but due to the brutality of the attack, the jury convicted her of second-degree murder in September of 2010 and sentenced her to 27 years in prison. At the age of 18, Christina Pongratz fell for 77-year-old William Herchenreiter, the former president and CEO of Delta Star. Over a decade later, Christina lived with William in his sprawling mansion in Good Virginia, where she was well taken care of. 
William doted upon Christina with expensive gifts, all expense paid trips, and plenty of cash, in addition to getting her a job at his former company. For over 10 years, the odd pair seemed genuinely happy, but a deadly combination of alcohol and fury brought the dream crashing down. On May 4, 2010, William told Christina it was over and kicked her and a friend out of the house. Fuming, Christina drank the night away and returned to the mansion in a hazy rage and attacked the elderly man. She brutally beat him with his own cane, threw patio furniture at him, and nearly tore off one of his ears, all before passing out in the bloody mess. Police arrived after a domestic disturbance call and found Christina unconscious but unharmed, and William, who was barely breathing. He was expected to make a full recovery, but he died just days after being released from the hospital. Christina's attorneys claimed William's death was due to his pre-existing heart and blood pressure conditions, but the jury felt otherwise. Christina was sentenced to 15 years in prison after pleading no contest to second-degree murder. Even though she appeared remorseful, begging William's family for forgiveness, it seems sorry came a little too late. Catherine Becker's childhood in Vietnam was riddled with sexual abuse, but as an adult, she seemed to be doing well, married and living in Orange County, California. But in 2011, just 16 months into the matrimony, things quickly deteriorated. Catherine allegedly found out her husband was secretly still seeing his ex-girlfriend, and accused him of sexual and emotional abuse, which ended in a divorce. The pair continued to live together for a while after, and Catherine seized the opportunity for her revenge. She drugged her husband's food, tied him to their bed, and cut off his penis with a 10-inch kitchen knife. After, she took the severed member and stuffed it into the running garbage disposal. On the phone with 911, she repeatedly yelled that he'd deserved it. Catherine's ex was rushed to the hospital, along with the remains of his penis, but while doctors stemmed the bleeding, they couldn't salvage his severed member. Catherine was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after seven years for torture and aggravated mayhem, while her husband would continue to suffer for the rest of his life, as a normal sex life was next to impossible. In 2001, retired Santa Clara County police officer John P. Hogan and his wife Christine McFadden divorced. Christine earned custody of the children, but made sure they had their father around. But that wasn't enough for John. After the separation, 44-year-old Christine's veterinary clinic thrived and she lived in a large mansion, while John was unemployed due to a disability and faced eviction from his townhouse. Most importantly, Christine had custody of the children which fueled John's short temper. But John was never violent until the morning of March 26, 2002, when Christine left the house at 6 a.m. for her routine walk. John snuck in, armed with a 40 caliber gun. He then murdered his three stepchildren, 17-year-old Melanie Willis, 15-year-old Stanley Willis, and 14-year-old Stuart Willis, and his biological daughter, 5-year-old Michelle. He cradled her body in his arms and turned the gun on himself. Police uncovered a chilling voicemail from John in which he claimed he was morally, physically, emotionally, and monetarily bankrupt. In moments, Christine's entire world was ripped out from under her. Christine carried out the work she believes her children would have done if they'd had the chance to grow up. She set up a scholarship, made an addition to a university library, and funded a children's playroom at a local hospital, all to help other children because she couldn't save her own. That's all for this episode. Special thanks to Rainbot for collaborating with me on this video. Please press on screen to visit her delightfully disturbing channel, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. And I'll see you next time.